Good morning, folks. This is Jimmy. We're on Thursday morning. If you still work for a living out there, you only got one more day on the weekend. But, you know, uh, the way the world is now, we're on kind of a 24-7 deal. I'm, you, people used to get off on the weekend. They don't have any more. It kind of goes with the changes that we talked about yesterday when we talked about, hey, hear this, yo, man. Has, it, has anything ever been like this before? We had a great uh, time at the Galena First Baptist Church last night, and I really, really had a lot of fun. It was a good Bible study and a good meal. Uh we started Joel yesterday, Prophet Joel, writing during the days of Joash, writing probably somewhere between 840 and 798, 795, somewhere in there. It's hard to pinpoint. As I explained yesterday, we date this by the enemies. Their enemies weren't Assyria. They weren't, uh, uh, they, they weren't the Babylonians. They were Edom and Tyre and Sidon and Philistia and Philistines, the coastal peoples, and Egypt, which was the world empire before the Assyrians. Now, uh, we'll just kind of recap where we were yesterday. And always bear in mind that when Joel writes, he's writing about a near fulfillment of his prophecy that people would see happening, but his language and the events he describes, some of which have never happened before, are far-flung prophecy yet in our future. Chapter 1 of Joel says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. It's about all we know is that Joel is the son of Pethuel. The rest is deduction and admittedly some speculation. Hear this, O oh, ye, ye, hear this, ye old men. That's me. Hear this, ye old men. And give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? And have you ever seen anything like this? We spent a long time yesterday talking about it, but it reminds me of something that Jesus said on the Mount of Olives when he was telling the disciples, disciples what was going to happen before he came back. And he talks about a time that would come. And he says in verse 21 of chapter 24 of Matthew, for then shall be great tribulation where we get to the name of the great tribulation, the seven years of hell on earth. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be, and then it adds this, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, not were, shall be shortened. So Jesus also talks about a time coming that nobody's ever seen before. Joel here is talking about a specific time that's going to happen that they've never seen the likes of before and also about a future time. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your father? Now in verse 3, tell ye your children of it. And let your children tell their children and their children another generation. See, this is just the way it's going to be in the millennial kingdom also. 
after that great tribulation and Christ sets up his kingdom right here on the earth and uh, will reign with him as kings and priests. Chapter 20 of Revelation, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Will it really be a thousand year kingdom? Well, it says six times here that it's going to be a thousand years. Six, count them six. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, the martyrs, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And blessed is holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. In the millennium, the Lord is going to restore the earth to much like it was during the original creation, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It's going to give humanity a taste of what they could have had from the beginning without pain, without death, without sorrow without sin. To make them understand Paradise Lost, if you want to talk about it in terms of Milton, Isaiah said that said if a man during this millennial age if he dies at a, a hundred years old they will say he was just a child because there will be mortals in this kingdom the people who will enter this kingdom is the remnant of the Jews that were supernaturally protected by God during the last half of the great tribulation where he hid them from the dragon. And those who were lucky enough to not get beheaded during the reign of the Antichrist, and they didn't take the mark, and they didn't. And see, all these will enter into the kingdom or And they shall be from every tongue and every kindred and every nation. So when it says here to tell your children about it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation, there will be time for the, those who survived and lived through the great tribulation and entered into the kingdom of God with Christ on the throne. Christ is going to sit on a literal throne in a literal palace on Mount Zion. He'll sit on the throne of his father, David, and he'll reign with the rod of iron, and the law shall go forth from Mount Zion. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and there's no end to his reign. 
It's everlasting. The world is going to change after the, the millennium, but not the reign of Christ. He will always be the Son of God. He will always be King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will always be the lamb that was slain. Now, we looked upon him as he were, as it were, a lamb that had been slain. And they said, worthy is the lamb to open up the seals. And that's what we saw in Revelation 4 and 5. Now, after Joel tells them that, hey, nothing's ever been like this. All you old men, you, you look around and see. And we talked about that yesterday. Yeah, that ain't never been like this. Uh, I've never seen such wickedness. You know, I think I saw more blood and guts on some uh, horror deal that we streamed on Netflix about, uh, I don't know what it was, some kind of religious cult, renegade Catholics or something. They were holed up in a monastery and sacrificing nuns for some reason. It was just a lot of nonsense. But I saw more blood and guts in that movie than I saw in all my time of growing up on TV. In the news every night, we were seeing real live battle and casualties on the battlefields of Vietnam. I heard more swearing and more cussing. More taking of the name of the Lord in vain, more profanity watching that show. I finally gave up watching that show. I don't know how it ended. I was interested because of this weird old cult that cl they claimed to be Catholics, but they were some kind of murder cult. And naturally, I forget the name of it because I can't. It was streaming on Netflix. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't take it no more. I like a good story, but when I'm being blasted by visions of blood and guts, and murder, human sacrifice, and, and hearing all that language, I can't stick with it. It's just not worth it. I don't want to hear that kind of talk. But I heard more profanity than I heard growing up on the north side of Houston, and those boys were rough. And I we saw more simulated sex in that movie than probably, you know, than I saw in all the movies I ever saw growing up. I saw more than that in an hour. Things are not like they used to be. I know everything changes. Everything has always changed. But there has never been such wickedness upon the face of the earth, except for the days before the flood. You know, Jesus said, while we're talking about we need to remember this time because there's never been a time like it. Well, and, and the, the memories of the old men, there's never been a time like it. But Jesus talks about a time, again in Matthew 24. He talks about a time. And uh, there's not going to be nothing like it. Ever be anything like it, never going to be anything like it. But he describes the time would be like this. But in verse 37 of Matthew 24, but as the days of Noah were, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And now this this part applies to the Great Tribulation. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't talk about the signs for the rapture. These are this is life after the rapture during the Great Tribulation. But if we can see the signs of the Great Tribulation, then how close is the rapture? It could happen any day or night. You know, it's always pictured in the scriptures coming at night. For as in the days that were before the flood, 
They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So human history has seen it like this before, even if I haven't seen it like this before. And I know that Joel is talking to me because he said, ye old men. Well, I'm a, I'm a ye old man. I'm a me old man. Me oh my oh on the bio. What was it like right before the flood? We go back to Genesis 6 and look and discover what it was like before the flood. I know a lot of people have different ideas and different versions of this, but I'll tell you what the Bible says because that's the only idea and version I care about. And it's the only version you should care about because it is the only one that is true. That's something to think about. Chapter 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also was flesh, and yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. He's going to cut it off in a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days. Also after that, when the sons of God came into unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. And the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. This is why God destroyed the earth with a flood. Because of sexual impurity, sexual immorality, sexual idolatry. You don't have to watch a parade or see the opening of a, the Olympics to see it. You see it every day on the street and on the TV. It's all there for you to see. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's our state. And it certainly was then. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Double and tonder. He created man from the face of the earth. The dust from the dust of the earth. And now he's going to destroy him from, like take him off the face of the earth. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Those are one of the greatest verses in the Bible. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah. So that's what it was like. That's what it's like now. I mean, it's worse now than it was then. We're doing some things now that would make the people in Noah's day blush. But you know, we've forgotten how to blush. So we just put up with it. So there was a time when things were this bad. But we don't remember it. Even the old men don't remember it. The only thing that to remind us is the record of it recorded by Moses the servant of God in the book of Genesis tell ye your children Clint good morning tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and let their children another generation 
That's the word damn. After God does what he has to do in judgment, tell every generation after you how bad it was so that they don't forget. At the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, Satan is loosed from his containment for a little season. He will gather up an army that no man could know. Multitudes, multitudes. <coughs> that wasn't very attractive. And they will forget what happened, even though the Lord says, remember. Did you know sin is what makes you forget? Sin is what helps you forget. You think about those good old days. Well, if you were objective about them, they weren't very good at all. And I was a drunk, a liar, a sinner, fornicator, gambler, con man, white collar thief, by that I mean I convinced people to invest in things and then spent their money to live on and never had any real intention of paying it back because I was a drunk. And they expected you to pay for whiskey at the counter. They wouldn't just give it to you. I haven't had a drink in 27 years because of the grace of God. He took it away from me and he restored me to the gospel ministry. Now, we've established that Joel is saying, hey, the old men, you ain't going to remember anything like this. You don't remember anything like this ever happening before. And he said, tell it to your children, your grandchildren, and their, grand and their grandchildren. Don't ever let people forget what happened here. Well, obviously people have forgotten what happened here, or I wouldn't be trying to teach it to you. You would already know it. But the information is here. Verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left the canker worm hath eaten. And which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Now there's been much ink spilled over this. They believe that it was a long series of droughts and crop failures. Uh, kind of like the way the Dust Bowl developed in the United States. I mean, it just didn't hit in 1930 or 31 or 32 or whatever and send all the Okies on the road to California like in, uh, like in the Grapes of Wrath. It didn't just happen. It happened season after season after season after season. And one of the things that contributed to it was, the, was World War I even before we got into the war, wheat prices were sky high because the world was at war and somebody had to make the bread. Somebody had to grow wheat so they could make the bread. So the entire midsection of the United States, good morning, Pastor Susie from Lahore, Pakistan. Good morning. Um, so... <laughs> They grew wheat, and they grew wheat, and they grew wheat, and they depleted the ground. After the war, they were trying to feed the world because the, the plague of influenza, the Spanish flu, killed, I don't know, 50 million people, 100 million people. I don't remember how many. It was a bunch. and killed uh, not as many as World War I did, but it killed a lot of people uh, in the wake of World War I. And all through the 20s, we produced, we overproduced, we put more land into production. And we were never renewing the soil. We were not taking care of the land. Erosion, 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 erosion. And one day in either 31 or 32 in Oklahoma, it rained in the spring, and it didn't rain a drop for years. It just stopped. It's a hand to God on a nation that thinks it can make it on his own. The Great Depression was a judgment because of our worship of money and materialism, the worship of our own prosperity during the 20s, the roaring 20s, when people would 
buy, sell, steal, and kill just to get get whiskey out of Canada or rum up or tequila up out of Mexico. Drinking rum and coca cola. <laughs> yeah, but not a long time. So they destroyed the land and it became dust and it just blew and it blew and it blew. I knew an old man called it the land transfer. It blew from that side of the road to that side of the road. <laughs> it was a land transfer. Old man Joe in the grapes of wrath said, holding this dirt in his hands, he said, it's my dirt. And he gets a weird look on his face because he didn't want to leave. He says, it ain't no good, but it's mine. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way we feel about our material things. They don't do us any good, but they're ours. Some think that this was over many years, and it could have been, but these different insects, they have different uh, different characteristics. Now, some people think that it's the same in insect at different stages of its development, and that could be true. Uh, the palmer worm is basically a a caterpillar that eats the holes in the leaves like the ones that get on your tomato plants. The, <clears throat> the locust was the, the jumping, leaping, flying insect that would come in swarms and come down on a field and eat, not leave anything green and just eat it all. And then the canker worm was perhaps the worst uh, it it crawled on the ground and not on the leaves, and it lapped up the grass. It just so if you could imagine a row of these little little caterpillar looking things, these canker worms. That their entire job is they're just licking the grass. You see them go across the field, and all the green just start disappearing in a pasture or a meadow or a valley. The home in the meadow was no more home because the canker worm licked it all up. Now, whether these were three stages of the same insect and they came in waves of the life cycle of those insects or whether it was three separate attacks, whether it went on for several years or came in a season, we don't know what the result is. They had massive famine, Massive crop failure, massive drought, and the land was parched and cracked. And and if you spit on it, you couldn't even tell where you spit. It sucked it up so quick. That's what they were facing. Verse 4, that which the palmer worm at the left, the locust had eaten. And that which the locust at the left, the canker worm. Eat. And that which the canker worm hath eaten left hath the caterpillar eaten. So see, it's a caterpillar again. So maybe it's a, a life cycle. We're not sure. But it's cyclical in the fact that it just kept happening over and over again to cause these great droughts because we know that a drought is not made in one season. We know from living in the West and me coming from Southwest Texas, when well, my family came from Southwest Texas, close to the Mexican border. I mean, an average year's rainfall for Junction, Texas in Kimball County is like 14 inches. Now with all that rain they had earlier this summer, I think they got that. I think they got a year's worth of rain in two days there. <laughs> I'm not going to use the colorful language that my, Uncle used to describe how hard it rained, but it was enough. It was enough. It's what uh, folks around here call a call a, a toad strangler. Now, in verse 5, after he's described the problem, he says, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep. Howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of your new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. When things go from bad to worse... The human, on his own, wants to seek comfort. We seek comfort as a species in three ways when we're left to ourselves. 
we like to, my generation, you would refer to it as sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's what we turn to. And what the war didn't kill, sex, drugs, rock and roll did. My generation is a lost generation, as lost as Scott Fitzgerald's generation was after the war during the 20s. They were a lost generation. Uh, <laughs> so what these people have done, they've turned to comfort. And they're drinking wine. The wind's blowing outside and they drink wine. They sit inside their house and drink wine. They, they cry because their crops are destroyed. And then their house is getting sandblasted every day. Have you seen those videos of the Dust Bowl in the central United States? We talk about Kansas and Oklahoma and North Texas, but it ran all the way to the Canadian border. The whole wheat belt. And so you drink, you listen to the wind blow, and you get drunk and you cry and you hope it'll be different tomorrow and it never is. That's what life is without God. You seek comfort. A guy will seek comfort in whiskey in the arms of a strange woman and in fantasies, fantasies of that it's going to get better, that if I can just borrow some money from the bank, I can plant the crop. Maybe I can get some irrigation. Maybe I can just pack up and leave and go someplace where the conditions are better. That's what seeking comfort looks like apart from Christ. You know, I've, I've been living in Second Peter, uh, First Peter for a couple of days. And because my short-term memory is so bad, I can't tell you the, exactly how the verse goes, but I love it. Um, in First Peter chapter 5, there's this wonderful verse or series of verses where, G, where Peter, as an old man, and Mark, we don't know whether Mark, whether Peter was disabled or couldn't write, but Mark wrote this down apparently, and he was he was serving. He was a servant to Peter, and whether or not. Mark wrote the letter. He certainly carried the letter to Paul from Babylon. Verse chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. And here's where it's really been haunting me and making me read it over and over again. Uh, Second part of verse 5 onward, it says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility. That means if that brother doesn't, thinks that, you know, doesn't agree with you on the number of angels that can dance on the head of a pin, and that you should be humble. And uh, you can state your opinion if you wish, but don't tell him he's going to hell if he don't think like you do. We've lost sight of that. We're more concerned about being right than we are about about uh, winning souls. We're more concerned about being right than we are about living holy lives separated from this world. We've abandoned sight of holiness and soul winning because of our pride. We've got to be right. 
did you know that hell is, pe- is going to be full of people, and it's full of people now who, who had the exact right doctrine. They did everything right. They, uh, according, uh, you know, according to their systematic theology, everything was right. They never, they never broke a rule. But they didn't know Christ. And they're in hell. Our churches are full of people who are going to hell because we have a, mostly an unregenerate membership because they bought a ticket to heaven or they bought fire insurance and they have not committed their lives to follow the risen Christ. There's a big difference. Are you once saved, always saved? Absolutely. But the catch is, is you have to be saved. And if you're not following Christ, you don't belong to him. That's not his fault. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in good time, in due time. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And of course, this finishes up with casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. But that's what we do when we know Christ when we serve the risen Christ, when we follow after Christ, when we bow in all humility to Christ and subject to ourselves to Him and therefore the Father. All within and due to and because of the ministry of the Holy Ghost, which is powerful in us because of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off of your mouth. Now, if you're drinking wine and trying to ignore your problems and using the things of this world, sex, drugs, rock and roll, it could be, could be sex, booze, and entertainment, bread and circuses, which, uh, you know, the government is always ready to Uh, provide how's it cut off from their mouth because there is no harvest in the drought palmer worm the locust the canker worm the caterpillar they've eaten it all up the vines are gone the grapes are gone even the very roots are dried up and blowed away and without a vineyard, without something to put in the wine press, and without jugs or skins or barrels for fermentation, then there's no more wine. When I was a drunk, I used to hate to hear last call because that means I got to get me one more drink and that's all I can have until morning unless I got some stashed at home. Well, God has given Judah a last call here, saying, hey, the wine's gone now. What are you going to drink? You think you can turn to me now? Now that I've blown all your crops away, now that I've blown all your land away, now that you hide in your cabin and stay drunk all the time, and sleep with whoever you can find to bed, and... Entertain yourselves with fantasy of it'll be better tomorrow. It'll be better next year. If I could only do this, if I could only do that, I can pull it out. Cut off the wine finally because there's no wine left. And if you don't grow grapes, and you don't crush the grapes, and you don't let the wine ferment, and if you don't package it, you can't drink it. There ain't no wine. 
and shall sooner or later even the rich people run out of wine when there's none growing to replace it. And that's how the wine is finally cut off from their mouth. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep. And how, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. You know, we have, we've had some, some physical drought, of course, out west and southwest for years. And, and over the last 10, 15 years, we've had periods of severe drought here in the lower Middle West and on through the old, the old South, the Confederate South. Places like Georgia and Alabama, I never saw that kind of drought before. It's better now. But we have a drought now. And no amount of sin can cover up for the fact that we're in a drought. And we're in a drought of faith. We're in a drought of mercy because we don't seek it. We're in a drought of grace because we don't claim it. We're in a drought that has destroyed. There's no water. There's no food. Because what we need are not those physical things, but the Word of God. It's a famine that Amos talked about. I think that Amos comes after Joel, don't he? It says... In verse 11 of chapter 8, Amos is, he's, a, he's from Judah, but he's prophesying to Israel, the northern kingdom. Probably early at the same time, in, early in Isaiah's ministry. Amos says from the Lord, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, from north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. And shall not find it. They were there then. We're there now. We've never had so much wisdom. I mean, we've never had so much information and no wisdom at all as a country, as a people. Children are our oppressors, and women rule over us. Not a good way to be. And we finally come to the point where the wine is cut off. The things we used to tell ourselves that everything would be fine, we've used them all up. Now we have to face the fact that we are neck deep in sin and in a mess of our own creation. It's all our doing. Oh, wow, I got to get off here. I got to go to Hollister. I love all y'all. We will take this up again tomorrow in the first chapter of the book of Job. God love you. Uh, this was supposed to cut off. Why is it not cutting off?